cardiologist, as I said before, just another member of your um, interdisciplinary healthcare team here to help you with your service to your geriatric patients. I wanted to kind of give you an overview of some of the other members all related to hearing on your healthcare team. Audiologists typically are now doctorally prepared hearing specialists, non-medical, um, who are involved in the non-medical treatment and intervention for hearing loss. Hearing aids, cochlear implants, assistive devices, counseling, prevention, uh, very much concerned about that. Um, you may also have audiologists on your team who are master's degrees um, who receive their education prior to the doctoral requirement. Um, Olaryngologists are medical hearing specialists or ear specialists, ear, nose, and throat specialists. Otologists are, again, otolaryngologists who have specialized particularly in ears. Some otolaryngologists specialize in noses and sinuses and throats and the larynx and the voice. Others specialize in ears. Um, others are otoneurologists who specialize in diseases, problems, pathologies of the central auditory system, like tumors of the um, acoustic nerve, for example, or above. And then hearing aid dealers, hearing aid instrument specialists, typically have high school educations and a license to sell hearing aids. And so you'll run into all of these individuals who are members of the hearing health care team. We call hearing loss the invisible handicap. Um, we all know an individual with hearing loss or more. Probably some of you in this room have hearing loss as well. Over 25 million, and that's probably an underestimate, of folks in the United States have significant hearing loss. Um, and yet a very small percentage of them, maybe 24%, are getting some help for that, in, particularly in the form of hearing aid intervention. You don't look hard of hearing. Mm -hmm. People without it rarely understand it. Unless you acknowledge the symptoms, you can be interpreted as being confused, um, possibly pre-demented, um, possibly just uncaring and uninterested in what other people have to say to you, and um, maybe just totally stuck up because you never respond to your name when they call it. Um, Often the person with the hearing loss is the last person they, who knows they have the problem. Everybody around them um, knows it before they do, and yet they think they're just fine. We have lots of statistics related to hearing loss. Um, the bottom line is a lot of people have it. And when we get into that 65-year category and older, 30 35%, 50% of folks 65 and older have hearing loss, significant enough to interfere with communication. When you think of Dr. Espinoza's talk, think of hearing loss as one of those other predisposing factors in terms of frailty and those adverse clinical outcomes that she was talking about. Um, it's the third most prevalent chronic condition in the older population, and hearing loss and tinnitus or tinnitus, um, doesn't matter which way you say it, are the most common military service related disabilities that we deal with. Um, but not all old ears are bad ears, and you know individuals who, who are into their 80s and still hear pretty well. So hearing loss, it's the visible disorder, loss of hearing due to problems in the auditory system, which we will talk about. And the auditory system includes the peripheral, and the central auditory system, and I'll give you a little more anatomy on that. Hearing difficulty or hard of hearing, we say that person is hard of hearing um, because they have difficulty hearing. We don't typically use hearing impaired. Um, it implies a, an impairment that they are impaired. So it's fall, fallen out of disfavor. So if you're talking about a person with hearing loss, talk about the fact that that person has hearing loss or is hard of hearing. Hearing problem or a hearing handicap is really the perception by the individual who has it that they've got a problem, that they're experiencing difficulty secondary to their hearing loss. Age-related hearing loss is called presbycusis, um, and we say that hearing loss is a normal part of aging, and yet there are some studies, the Mabon 
um, tribe, which is a Sudanese tribe done back in the 60s by Rosen, showed that the seniors, the elders in that group of folks had hearing very similar to our youngers um, for a variety of factors. But it's not, it's not necessary that all old ears necessarily are impaired or bad ears. Symptoms of presbycusis, the speech of others seems mumbled, high-pitched sounds like the S and the TH are difficult to hear or even differentiate. Male voices easier to hear than females. Certain sounds seem annoyingly loud. Um, it's a kind of a paradox. I can't hear you. I can't hear you. Stop shouting at me. So it's a very reduced range of what is audible and what is uncomfortable for these individuals. Many of them have ringing or tinnitus, um, often caused initially by noise exposure. Hearing but not understanding, speaking too loudly, typically um, the individual, we're all trying to hear ourselves at what we perceive to be a normal level. You've experienced when you've been in a background of noise and the, suddenly the noise is gone and you're talking like this and didn't realize it because you're trying to hear yourself. Um, needing sounds to be louder to be heard, but not too loud. Hearing better sometimes than others. Oftentimes family members say, he hears me when I want, he wants to hear me. Well, it's often because he heard you when you were one-on-one -on -one and it was quiet and you could see your face. He didn't hear you when the TV was on and you were talking from the kitchen. Um, being excessively tired at the end of the day. Um, it's fatiguing to try to listen through a hearing loss. Irritable, negative, angry. Um, we know that hearing loss is related to symptoms of depression and withdrawal. So when you think about your depressed patients, really look at them closely for the presence of hearing loss. Um, the withdrawal, the social isolation, the feeling that everything is happening around them and they're not a part of it. Social rejection and loneliness, reduced alertness, increased risk to personal safety. They don't hear that car coming necessarily or the honking behind them. Impaired memory. Reduced ability to learn new tasks. Um, if you're trying to learn a new language through a hearing loss, it's very, very difficult or maybe even impossible. And yet that's something that our older folks would like to do is maybe become bilingual or take a language class, but they can't hear the subtle differences in the new sounds. Reduce job importance, diminish psychological um, function. Some of the frustrating situations, somebody calls from the upstairs and starts to talk to you and you don't have a clue what they've said. Um, if you're invited to a dinner party, it's kind of dark. There are maybe six folks around the table. They've got music on in the background. You really can't understand what anybody's really saying, so you don't participate in your scene as just uninterested, um, and you go home very frustrated and um, just don't want to do that again. You're at the grocery store, the clerk is doing, doing her thing at the counter, you're asking for repetition what she said, um, and pretty much, pretty soon, you just stop asking and just smile and nod. People attribute these things to things other than hearing loss. Um, you're spacey, inattentive, preoccupied, as I said before. Have you ever felt these symptoms yourself? Um, I have. Unrehabilitated hearing loss affects the whole family. So it's not just the individual, it's a family problem. Um, it affects spousal interactions, it affects your ability to hear your grandchildren to hear over the phone, all of the things you want to do as um, an adult, as a, as a functioning, high-functioning human being. Hearing is essential to a lot of that. It's a choice to rehabilitate your hearing. Um, and we're helping these individuals become aware and make that choice. So what, what is our kind of challenge? going from hearing loss, bridging this gap, to the acceptance of the loss, the knowledge that it exists, the awareness of it, and the desire to do something about it, and to help them bridge that gap. Change is hard. Um, how do we help these folks change? Well, perception and motivation. It's all about both of those. A person really has to want to do something to help themselves. Um, 
Our goal, prevent further hearing loss. Use that ear protection when you're using your lathes and your table saws and mowing the lawn when you're going to the concerts. Um, and then acceptance and intervention with rehabilitation that we have available, very uh, effective rehabilitation, including the technology of hearing aids that I'll talk about. So for our patients, getting them to admit they have it and wanting to do something about it. Why is it hard to admit you have a hearing loss? Any thoughts? Denial? Procrastination? Yes? My husband has hearing loss and he knows he has it, but he doesn't want to spend the money to, you know, fix the problem. And so everything yeah. you've described, we've been living with. She's saying that her husband has it, but he doesn't want to spend the money to try to do something to help himself. And um, that's very common in terms of the cost of technology. Hearing aids shouldn't cost so much. They should be affordable and available to everybody who needs them. Um, hearing loss doesn't occur overnight. It's a lifelong kind of slide into hearing loss. And really, you don't realize. If you've experienced going up in the mountains, and when you get to the top of the mountain, your ear pops and you hear better. And you didn't realize you weren't hearing so well. It just kind of gradually shut down. That was a eustachian tube problem that you cleared up when you opened your mouth. Um, and you lose subtle sounds first, the pff and the ss and shh, um, which makes differences between words. When you hear free and she and c and t and p, they all sound like e to the person with hearing loss. Um, why else? It's one of kind of the historical symptoms of aging. You had your hand up back there. No, I was going to say vanity. Vanity. Yeah. Um, yeah. And just wearing that hearing aid. Technology now in hearing aids is very cool. There are just all kinds of colors in hearing aids and you see people running around with things in their ears all the time. Well, hearing aids are now are just another one of those things to put in your ear. But they help. Um, who said this? Forgive me when you see me draw back when I would have gladly mingled with you. My misfortune is doubly painful to me because I am bound to be misunderstood. For me, there can be no relaxation with my fellow men, no refined conversations, no mutual exchange of ideas. I must live almost alone like one who has been banished. I can mix with society only as much as true necessity demands. If I approach near to people, a hot terror seizes upon me, and I fear being exposed to the danger that my condition might be noticed. Who said that? Ludwig and Beethoven. Mm -hmm. How about this? Blindness separates us from things, but deafness separates us from people. Helen Keller. Helen Keller, mm -hmm. right. And that's true. I mean, hearing loss is really the life quality determiner for the folks that you work with. You think, what do they look forward to? They look forward to talking to you, to their family, to trying to understand the uh, healthcare delivery system, to try to remember all those medications they're hearing about. You talk about polypharmacy compliance issues. Well, many of that is, much of that could be related to their ability to hear what's being said and to remember that. So, I've given you some, this is an um, assessment tool that you can use, perhaps. It's a little long. It has both um, emotional and social components to the tool. It's the hearing handicap inventory for adults, a screening version. So, an emotional, does a hearing problem embarrass you when meeting new people? A yes is worth four, sometimes is a two, and a no is zero. A social question, does a hearing problem cause you difficulty when in a restaurant conversing with others? Again, the total score then, you add that up. If it's between 0 and 8, there's no handicap. If it's 26 to 40, a severe handicap. Um, you might get as much information by just saying, do you think you have a hearing loss that gets in the way of you talking with other people, hearing and understanding other people? and then contrast that with asking the family member the same thing. Do you think he has or she has a hearing loss? Um, and very often you'll find you get very different answers to that question. And if you do, that really puts them at high risk for the fact they have a hearing loss and that you need to encourage them to then make the next step in this system of acceptance. 
All right, how do we hear? I'm going to just give you a little anatomy lesson very quickly. We've got the outer, the middle, and the inner ear. And these are parts of the peripheral auditory system. And the outer ear consists of the pinna and the ends of the eardrum. So the ear canal there is a big problem in our folks because in the cartilaginous portion you have the cerumen glands. And they just get very overactive in some of our elderly um, individuals. Typically, we don't need to do anything to clean the ear canal. It really is a great self-cleaning mechanism. It produces wax, it dries up, and it continuously moves skin as it's sloughing skin out to the periphery, which then falls out in a little blob. But for some individuals, that system just kind of slows down and we get an accumulation of cerumen um, that can totally impact that canal. Um, and you may see it in one ear, and the other ear is perfectly clear, no cerumen. Um, what we want to try to do is when that is totally impacted, get it out of there so it's not a contributing factor to both hearing loss and ear care. Um, if they're getting water in their ear and it gets behind that cerumen between the eardrum and the cerumen, it sets them up for swimmer's ear or that fungal kind of infection in the um, external ear that can be very painful, canal swells, um, and if we can get rid of the wax, we can try to kind of stave that off um, in our folks. And particularly if you're referring them for audiology intervention, clean out the cerumen before they're seeing an audiologist for hearing testing or hearing aids. The eardrum, typically fine in our folks. The middle ear where the three bones, the hammer, the anvil, the stirrup, it's an air-filled space. The eustachian tube connects it with the mouth and that's functioning pretty well in most of our individuals. The inner ear, the cochlea, and the vestibular system. So when we talk about the frail elderly and fall, prone to falls, um, that's part of that is related to a poorly functioning semicircular canal or vestibular system, which is part of the auditory system. It's very interesting in terms of how sound is processed by the auditory system. That ear canal resonates to all the frequencies that are in our environment, but it particularly resonates to that frequency range 2,000 to 4,000 hertz or cycles per second, which is the critical frequency range that are important for us to de discriminate tss, sh, a, e, u. Uh, so it's very tuned in terms of early processing to our speech production. If we had elephant ear canals, it would be resonating down at maybe 125 hertz, which would not be a, at all useful to us. Important speech, frequency for, speech frequencies for us are in that mid to high frequency range. So it's a very well-designed system. The middle ear, as I said, um, the eustachian tube. Um, the biggest thing that can go wrong with that tube in our folks is allergies. A lot of folks get here and they develop seer allergies. And, um, that inflames mucus linings all over the place, including the eustachian tube, and we start seeing middle ear problems in adults who just didn't have them before. And what, that ha what happens there is that the eustachian tube can no longer equalize air pressure, and instead of air in that middle ear space with all the bones, you start to extract fluid from the mucus lining, and that fills up with fluid. Um, which then stiffens up the system and gives them a temporary conductive hearing loss. And if that then becomes infected fluid, then you've got a, a otitis media or a middle ear infection. The inner ear is a very cool organ. Um, it is where all the action is in the auditory system. It changes sound from our environment, which is an acoustic vibratory event, into a neurological event, um, where these little hair cells then are responding to vibration and changing that vibration into an electrochemical neurological event that causes us to hear. So that inner ear's function is very important um, and is the site of the lesion in most of our adults due to noise exposure. Um, the inner ear has the organ of cordy and that's where these little hair cells are located and it sits on a vibrating membrane and that membrane vibrates in response to pressure coming into your outer ear. 
And if that pressure is extreme, that membrane just vibrates like crazy, and those hair cells can be ripped out of their mooring and totally destroyed. And we're only born with so many hair cells, and we lose them over time. Um, we're trying to figure out a way to regrow hair cells. You never see a deaf chicken because chickens can regrow their hair cells. And we've not, not figured that out in mammals yet, and that's coming. Um, and so this just shows you those outer, three rows of outer, the inner. The outer hair cells are the most susceptible to noise. And when you lose those, you can lose a lot of those before it starts showing up in your audiogram, which we're going to talk about. And what happens there is that you start losing your ability to clearly understand speech, particularly in noisy, difficult listening environments. Um, you lose the tuning of your system, not necessarily the sensitivity that shows up in the audiogram. This just shows you some great healthy stereocilia on the top of these hair cells and some very sick stereocilia, probably secondary to noise damage in this case. Um, we have temporary threshold shift due to noise exposure. You've gone to a concert, you come home, your ears are ringing, you feel damp, deadened with your hearing, you're just not quite, and you've got um, tinnitus, as I said. Hopefully, in 24 hours, 48 hours, these kind of rehydrate, do whatever they can do to get back to functioning status, and you're hearing better. But what we know is that even if your audiogram improves a bit, you're never really where you were before you had that damage um, in terms of going completely back to normal function. And then the central auditory system. And this is just all the crossings of the auditory neurons that are going up to the brain. And this is kind of where more sophisticated uh, use of sound for processing language occurs and the interaction of the sound system with all your other systems in terms of, you know, you hear that creak on the stairs and it evokes a memory of the stairs in your grandmother's house that used to creak just the same way. So you get this flood of intersensory and inter-brain um, uh, um, functions elicited by the auditory stimulus. So it's a very complex system, and the more central the auditory pathology, the harder it is to, to diagnose it. And you can think of kind of the most central auditory pathology as a, a, a temporal lobe stroke, for example, um, where the person loses total ability to process what's coming in auditorily, but they hear just fine. They just don't understand a single word that's being said to them in terms of the receptive aphasia. This is an audiogram, and this is the most basic kind of hearing test that all of our folks should have, um, who are saying, yeah, I think maybe I have a hearing loss. This um, is a test across frequencies. I explain to my patients as like a notes on the piano. The left are the bass, the right are the treble, and the frequencies in between are all the different pitches like the notes that are particularly important for understanding speech. The marks represent the softest level of each of those pitches that you could hear the sound about half the time that I gave it to you. And if the marks march down the page, that means I had to make it louder for you to hear. Normal means all your marks are between 0 and 25, 20 for adults across the frequency range. The X's are the left, the O's are the right. Types of hearing loss. We test by two ways. One is by a little bone vibrator that vibrates your whole skull and stimulates your inner ear directly and bypasses the outer and middle ear, and by earphones, which tests the outer, the middle, and the inner. If we see a difference between those two ways of testing, that says if the bone is better, that there's something wrong, uh, or there's good function in your inner ear, your cochlea, but there's something wrong in the conductive pathway, and we call that a conductive hearing loss. This shows you um, a right conductive hearing loss. The bone scores are within normal limits and the air scores are not. That could be secondary to like fluid in the middle ear, for example, or possibly a total puncture of the eardrum, or maybe a total occlusion of wax in the auditory canal. Sensory damage is damage uniquely to the cochlea. <clears throat> we rarely see just sensory damage. There's usually a neural component to it. Uh, but noise exposure that destroys those hair cells, sensory damage. It's demonstrated in this case by an audiogram that kind of has that notch configuration, that high frequency notch. 
shows fairly good hearing in the lower pitches and that notch loss at 4,000 with a little return at 8. Neural impairment of central auditory structures. So for example, an eighth nerve, an acoustic tumor growing on the eighth nerve, the vestibular acoustic nerve, is a central auditory pathology, usually reflected in real difficulty understanding speech in that ear. Maybe the pure tone audiogram is just a little different from the other ear, but the big difference is how they understand speech. And a mixed hearing loss in this case, the last one, shows you poor bone scores, but even poor air. And our hope is, if there's medical or surgical intervention, you can get those air scores, in this case it's the right ear again, up to equal the bone. But that's as good as we can hope that person to hear. And central pathology is, as I said, a stroke is an example of extreme central pathology. <clears throat> Diabetes, Alzheimer's, dementia, all create central auditory processing problems in our folks. Usually it's the ability to process difficult stimuli when there's a lot of noise, when the rate of speech is rapid, um, they just can't put it all together as a normal system would be able to do. Sensory neural hearing loss is the most common in our adults. This is an example of just degrees of hearing loss, which just says that hearing loss can be different degrees at different pitches. So in this case, this person has normal hearing at 250 hertz. It has um, maintained through 1,000, sloping down to a severe hearing loss at 6,000 hertz. So you can see on a report, normal to severe hearing loss, 250 through 8,000 hertz. And it just says that not all frequencies are affected the same by various pathologies. And noise typically affects high frequencies, and age typically affects high frequencies first. This is a nice audiogram in that it shows how speech sounds in normal conversational speech um, are portrayed on the audiogram. And what this says is that the vowel sounds are low frequency, are louder in normal conversational speech at about four or five feet away. The high frequency sounds like the F, the TH, the S, are very high frequency sounds and very soft. And so in a person with that previous audiogram, they're not hearing any of those high frequency sounds because they're too soft. Their thresholds require louder um, high frequencies, which is typically what hearing aids do. They make those frequencies selectively louder. We um, have been doing a project using the Ling 6 sound test, which is something that I um, uh, recommend to you with your patients. It's very easy. At about three feet, you just have the patient say, just repeat back, close your eyes and repeat these sounds back to me. And you say, ah, uh, they say, whatever they say, ah, uh, e, Ooh, ooh, s. No response. Shh. No response. Mm. Mm. What does that indicate? That person didn't hear it. Shh. What does that say? They got a hearing a high frequency hearing loss in their best ear. What do you do? You say. I mean, what do you think? I'm going to have to talk a little louder to that patient. I'm going to have to talk a little slower, which we call clear speech, and use shorter sentences to help them hear what I'm saying. And I'm going to give them visual cues. Always with your patients, let them see your face throughout your whatever you're doing with them. And I know that's hard in some of the procedures. Um, when you're, for example, taking a history and you're at a computer and they're sitting next to you in, the, in a clinic room, make sure your computer monitor is on the same side as they, so that when you're looking at your computer, you're not looking away, you're looking at them and they're able to see everything you say in terms of your speech cues. A lot of our um, exam rooms are not set up that way, so I'm, I'm challenging you to, when you go into your exam rooms, shove the computer monitor over to where at the side of the desk that the patient is sitting on. We also are encouraging you for these patients to use a pocket talker or a comfort duet. It's a little personal amplifier that you put on their ear, turn it up to where it's comfortable for them, and use that throughout your encounter. And in our GEM clinic, we're introducing 
seven, six or seven new um, comfort duets for use with patients who um, are demonstrating hearing loss, which is most, most of them. So ideally, we should be using these with most of our geriatric patients in most encounters, <clears throat> and particularly those who don't have hearing aids, which is the majority of them. This audiogram just shows that this individual hears primarily the vowels because they're above, they're louder than his thresholds, and is missing a lot of those mixed vowel consonants and the high frequency consonants. What do you think this per what would you predict this person's communication ability to be like? Talking to you without visual cues. You think they get along okay? No, they probably are missing just about everything you're saying. Um, and <clears throat> anytime our thresholds get to that 40 dB level or worse, in particularly in this 1,000, 2,000, 4,000 and above range, we can predict they're having problems whether they admit them or not. All right, if we could run just that second example, Joe, the 10-word hearing test. You have a piece of paper, take it out, and I'll give you a test that the will hearing demonstration demonstrate to you what a test hearing loss sounds like. Ten thing. words. The words have been chosen so that they are easily confused with other words that sound much the same. You will hear the list three times. Each time, write down the words you hear. For the first reading, most of the very high frequency sounds will be filtered out, so it will seem as if you have a fairly severe hearing loss you are going to have trouble understanding the words. Even if you can't hear a word clearly, go ahead and write down your best guess. As you listen, write the words in column A on the worksheet. Here is the first reading of the list. Ready? Number one. Four. Number two. Five. Number two. Five. Number two, move. Number five, ride. Number six, bed. Number seven, foot. Number eight, bed. Number nine, bed. Number All right, let's do the last one, Joe. So when somebody says, I hear you, but I can't understand you, list of words, that's a third time, experience. But this time, they will be recorded normally, with all of the high and low tones present. This time, list the words in column C. Number one, Phil. Number two, catch. Number three, thumb. Number four, knee. Number five, wise. Number six, bath. Number seven, fish. Number eight, shows. Number nine, bed. Number 10, juice. All right, thanks, Joe. Oh, well, how'd you do? <laughs> <laughs> if you would have bet the house on that, you probably would have lost the house, right, in your ability to pass that test. Well, that's what our folks are going through every day of their lives. Um, all right, let's talk about how we can prevent further deterioration of hearing loss. Um, we can either do it at the source, make things quieter, which is the ideal. We can do it in the path, put a box around it so you don't hear it as loudly, or at the individual using ear protection, ear plugs. There are a variety of options. A little foam are great. If you um, kind of squish them up into a carrot, push them in, and let them expand until you have a hearing loss. That's you see people with them just kind of hanging out of their ears. It's not doing anything. Um, Preformed plugs and the earmuffs—they're all good if they're worn um, correctly.
correctly. Um, when is noise potentially damaging loud? If you, at three feet from a person, have to raise your voice to maintain conversation, then the noise is potentially damaging your hearing. It's 85 dB or greater. Um, if it's easier to converse in a situation where you plug your ears and you hear that person more clearly, that says that your auditory system is being distorted and potentially being damaged. And if when you leave you've got ringing in your ears or your hearing feels damped or deadened, that says you've had a hearing loss from that noise exposure. Um, hearing, primary avenue for communication. It's the first thing that goes with hearing loss, as we were dis describing. As high frequency hearing loss sets in, you lose those abilities. Alerting and self-protecting, as it gets worse, you start losing that ability. And to hear the creaking stairs of somebody breaking into your house or the glass breaking. Or keeping us apart of the environment when it really affects that low frequency, 250 hertz. You just now see everything going on around you and you don't hear a thing. And you feel like you're in a bubble. And for people who've had this progressive process, they report that last loss as most devastating psychologically to them. But we know the first loss of communication predisposes them to difficulty communicating with the important people in their lives, withdrawal, depression, the things that communication really is fundamental uh, to. At a minimum, what should hearing aids do? This is just an example of how we assess objectively if a hearing aid is working in the ear canal. And it, it across the bottom are different pitches that we're trying to amplify along the side of how long, how loud we're making those pitches. And then the bottom line, solid line, represents the softest sounds a person can hear. That top solid line represents the uncomfortable limits of their hearing. And we want the hearing aid then to amplify sound within that range. So we want soft sounds to be audible. We want comfortable sounds that are comfortable for you with normal hearing to be comfortable for the person with hearing loss. And we want loud sounds to be loud but OK, um, as they are for us, uh, most typically. With intervention, effective intervention, hearing aids really is the most important kind of building block of auditory rehabilitation. Improved relationships, improved self-esteem, improved overall health. Family members typically see an even greater improvement um, than the individual themselves. And issues relative to decreased um, symptoms of depression we're finding as well. They come in all shapes and sizes, so there's something for everybody now. The technology is wonderful. Um, they fully automatic. They've adjust their own volume, they talk to each other, so if you do turn one up, the other one gets turned up. They communicate with each other in noisy environments. They decide if this is music and I'm gonna go into a music program that expands amplification into the higher pitches and the lower pitches, which is not what we do with speech usually. Um, if it's noise, they go into a directional mode, so they try to focus on what's in front of you instead of amplifying all around you. So we help our patients understand it's important to get the noise behind them. So that if the person they're trying to listen to is in front, the noise is more behind. If you have a choice in a table in a restaurant, pick the one in the corner, sit with your back to the rest of the restaurant, have the folks then face you and face the noise. So we're trying to help folks be very aware of how they can manipulate their environment to maximize their use of hearing aids and their communication success. So the technology is not the issue. It's getting the technology to the folks who need it. Um, and everybody who needs a hearing aid should have one. Um, that should be our goal. And um, the VA has set the gold standard for hearing aid delivery to our vets. And if your vets say, I think I've got a hearing loss, um, you refer them to audiology. And it's quite possible they'll be able to get hearing aids through that referral process. Um, they don't have to be service connected for their hearing loss. They have to be impaired in terms of their access to health care delivery um, in our environment. And we know how impaired hearing loss can make them in terms of what you're trying to do with them to help them just be fully functional. A lot of surgical options out there, they're typically not for our folks. Um, they're for um, certainly the cochlear implant. You've all heard about these. Um, these have devices that are, you let 
surgically implanted devices that where the processor is um, subcutaneous in that region just above the pinna, and there's a wire that you can see that goes from that processor through the middle ear space and goes into the round window of the cochlea. And that then is attached to an external, magnetically, kind of like a refrigerator magnet, to a um, transmitter that's attached to a little device that looks like a hearing aid, basically. So what this is doing is it's taking the sound from the environment, turning it into an electrical signal, transmitting that percutaneously to the subcutaneous transmitter, which then processes it digitally and turns it into an electrical signal that then is sent to the cochlea and tries to then simulate how a cochlea, how that basilar membrane and the organ of Cordy, how that would have processed that sound and stimulates then the first order auditory nerve directly, the neurons directly, the spiral ganglion and those first nerve cells. So it's taking the place of the cochlea, that's what it's trying to do. And they've evolved, they're just amazing. And this is a little girl, you can see that has that little transmitter magnetized onto her head and what we're finding is that for with a majority of our kids who are identified at birth, in Texas, you know, every baby has to have its hearing tested before it leaves the birthing hospital. If we really confirm at subsequent testing that baby has a hearing loss, um, we can intervene. And one of the interventions with severe profound loss are cochlear implants. More typically, it's hearing aids. Um, but we find that if we're effective in our early intervention, and we're, that's where we put our money, you know, with hearing loss early. Um, that these kids can develop speech and language skills very normally and need minimal assistance in the classroom once they're school age. So it's a pretty miraculous time for people with hearing loss. You know, if we can totally eliminate it, then I'd be out of a job and that'd be great. Um, but we're not quite there yet. But the technology is great. There are other kinds of devices. This is a middle ear implant that uses the eardrum as the microphone. You can see the ear canal down there and it's vibrating the eardrum, which is the microphone for the system that's implanted in the middle ear space. The battery is in there, and these batteries, from what I understand, have about the life of a pacemaker battery. Not like your typical hearing aid battery that lasts maybe 10 uh, days to two weeks. <clears throat> but, you know, the cost benefit of these is still out. You know, the jury's out on this. This, folk, this individual would be a great user of a traditional hearing aid. <clears throat> The Baja, the bone anchored hearing aid, is a pedestal implant that is vibrating the cochlea, the um, skull directly, and sending those vibrations directly to the best cochlea. And we use this with individuals who have, say, a totally profound hearing loss in one ear, just cannot hear anything, um, cannot use traditional amplification, but have a perfectly normal ear on the other side. So we give them sound awareness on that deaf side by putting the pedestal there, the microphone on that side, and then that vibrates the skull and sends that information to the normal cochlea. Um, we also use it for individuals who, for example, have chronic middle ear disease, that perf chronic perforated eardrums, draining ears, they could never put a device on their ear, but have good cochleas. They just have very um, abnormal peripheral auditory, the outer and middle ear function. And they even have them now with the magnetic coupling, and that's just showing this little girl down on the left. Um, similar magnetic coupling as the cochlear implant device coupling. I don't know that it works as well because the coupling is not as strong. You need a pretty strong magnet, which is what they're using. <clears throat> Other assisted devices, um, all of this array. And the biggest thing for you all is um, that Second picture down, the Comfort Duet, which is available through prosthetics. Um, an individual could get it, but they have service if you identify hearing loss and you want them to have it throughout their care encounter and bring it back the next time. Um, or you can have it in your clinics and just have a checkout protocol so that when they fail your Ling 6 sound test, you say, bring that Comfort Duet in, please. I'd like to use it with this patient. Do you mind if we use this? And you put it on, you kind of adjust it to where it's comfortable, and they say, wow, are you talking louder and clearer? One of the things we try to do as audiologists are just help the patient learn to manage their environment to minimize their hearing loss. That's auditory rehabilitation. 
Um, and so when we're doing the hearing aids, we're doing all of this other stuff as well as part of your healthcare team. And these are just some of the things we help people do. Inform the individual that you've got a hearing loss. This is just a kind of an encounter where you could minimize the problem for the individual. And you can help folks, say, in the gym clinic, um, kind of learn to do this. Um, inform the individual with the hearing loss of the topic you're discussing. Hey, we're talking about the Chargers game. And when the topic changes, the person who has better hearing says, hey, Harry, we're talking about the Spurs game now. And you, get, you clue them in to that the topic has changed. Um, and you speak directly to them, let them see your face. So it's something you can work with, um, kind of peer counseling for those with better hearing to help the people with hearing loss in their environment. And it gives them kind of a mission too. I used to do this in nursing homes in San Diego and it was kind of a peer support group and they loved learning about hearing loss and what they could do to kind of help identify folks who may have hearing loss, kind of refer them to the nursing staff for then possible follow-up and intervention. I mean, it was all done by peers on site. And trying to understand from the patient's perspective, you know, how does it make you feel when you're always asking for clarification? Um, and we've all been there ourselves. The big thing of the do's, get the person's attention, let them see your face, don't talk between rooms. We could um, eliminate a lot of family discord. People just would talk to each other in the same room instead of between rooms or floors. Um, make sure they see your face and lips and encourage the patient to keep their sense of humor You know, through this all. You know, they're not impaired. They have nothing to apologize about. They're just doing what they have to do to hear better. <clears throat> and appropriately fit hearing aids are the foundation, as I said, to rehabilitation with these folks. Um, and the VE is doing some very interesting things now with telepractice and tele-delivery of hearing aids um, to um, actually deliver hearing aids remotely. And we're doing it now with Kerrville and with Victoria so that patients can go there for their hearing aids. We can program them to, remotely. Um, we can do it all digitally, all the things that I've been talking about with the assistance of an on-site tech, uh, technician that can support the patient in the equipment interface and the audiologist in service, service delivery. Um, folks who are most successful with their hearing aids have two of them if they need them, so we just don't fit one hearing aid. Medicaid will only cover one hearing aid. They cover two glasses, but only one hearing aid. Um, and they wear them from the time they get up to the time they go to bed. Those are kind of the main takeaways, that you just can't be a part-time hearing. I'll just use it when I go to church, or when I go to the cafeteria. Uh, you need to wear it all the time. All right, any questions? Yes? Uh, the problem that I see is that a lot of the low-income people cannot afford hearing aids. Is there any kind of program that can Yes, the question was, the problem is that a lot of low-income people can't afford hearing aids, and that's a lot of our retired seniors. Um, Medicaid will only cover one, as I said, so it's not optimum functioning, optimum functioning that we're giving them with only one hearing aid. Um, they can't tell where sound's coming from, they can't extract speech from noise, they just are limited. Um, it's like if you have one eyeglass, it's a very similar kind of analogy. Um, we don't have a, a good safety net for hearing aids. They're covered by some insurance programs, but it depends on your plan. And of course, a lot of our seniors don't have the plans that cover hearing aids. Um, the VA, as I said, has a wonderful system. It has a low unit price that they get, that we get because of the volume. Um, so hearing aid companies need to partner with private folks to try to simulate the VA gold standard for delivery to give a unit price that would allow the practitioners to pass that on to their client with a service fee that for their professional services but that the unit cost is closer to $400 a hearing aid, $500 a hearing aid, not $2,500 per hearing aid. Um, and even that would be off-putting for some individuals to get the hearing aids. So we need this volume approach to that population that has absolutely no other way to afford amplification. But from your perspective, 
absolutely new in terms of their quality of life and what you're trying to do with them. Um, so that's my so that's kind of my challenge right now that I'm trying to work on and look at a tele-delivery, simulating what we've been doing in the VA in the real world out here with the public. Um, and there are a lot of barriers to that in terms of third-party coverage of telepractice that's changing in states, but um, Texas is slower in that regard. Um, the ability to for third parties to cover tele-delivery of hearing aids with a, a very high quality approach um, that we can now simulate because everything is digital and the audiologist can take full control of the equipment and the hearing aid at the site where the patient is without having to be there with a well-trained technician at that end. And so I'm trying to integrate, we have a grant through CMS uh, program, one of the district grants with um, public health nurses um, Dr. Cantu's nursing class, um, taking a small group of them who um, can use this as a clinical elective. It's a populations course. And the doctor of audiology students at UT Austin and, learn, and having them learn together how to assume their respective roles in delivery of teleaudiology, particularly hearing aid delivery, at a drop-in clinic that we're creating at the simulation center at the nursing school with the population we're then serving being the indigent population that has no other way to get hearing aids but need them and want them, um, being referred primarily by UHS, University of Health. So it's very inter-institutional, inter-professional education, uh, lots of hurdles to make it all come together, but uh, we've determined that the nursing students and the audiology students are all are available at the same time so we can have that simultaneous learning and when we will do the clinic and UHS has a population that absolutely fits into this category. They're not Medicaid, they're not Carolink, you know, they don't live necessarily in Bear County. Um, they're just in that group that you're talking about. Um, so we'll see how we can do, how well we do it. We need some agreement from the licensure board that they'll let us do this because they're saying we need more data, we need more data to show the effectiveness of telepractice delivery of hearing aids. And I said, well, the VA, I've given them the VA data. It's great data. You know, look how well we're doing in terms of patients on our outcome manager saying, my experience with my hearing aid is as good or better, we're finding, as they're getting in a face-to-face -face delivery system. And a lot of it, there's a halo effect related. They don't have to travel 200 miles to come and get their hearing aids. Um, but that means a lot, too, in terms of motivation and the desire to do something about their hearing loss. Um, so I'm hoping the licensure board will say, OK, we'll let you try this um, and let us know what you find. And maybe we'll change our mind about telepractice related to hearing aid delivery. Long answer to your question. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Uh, Dr. Novak. Okay, uh, we're going to break for lunch. Uh, we're going to resume in about 50 minutes at 1 o'clock, just to keep the schedule. And uh, we'll do Friday lunch again uh, today, so lunch will be right at the back. And again, we'll resume at 1 o'clock with uh, Dr. Joe Winifred on creating the resilience in dementia care. So come on back and uh, have a good lunch.